Greetings, my lovelies. I hope everybody's doing fantastic. I hope everybody's doing well. Back at with another video. This video is going to be focused around Jesus Christ being the Lord God's ultimate representative. And so, you know, I think a lot of Christians are really um, chasing their tails on trying to prove Jesus is God when they don't understand how Jesus can be the Lord, but not really be the Lord. And what do I mean by that? Well, in many of my videos, I've covered agency. Uh, for those of you who are new to agency, it might behoove you to go through some of my old videos. Um, I do break things down, uh, you know, because it helps to get immersed into the Hebraic understanding of Scripture if we read scripture through our Western lens and introduce our own thought processes into this, the waters can be a bit murky and they get muddied, right? We don't understand how Jesus Christ, who never once from his own mouth ever says he's God, but yet he seems to represent the authority of God, right? And so one of the most important passages, in my opinion, that have to do with the unification of God and his son are in John 12, 44 and 12, 45. And Jesus says, he cries out and said, he who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. So this means that if you believe in Christ, all of these things you believe about him being God, about his authority and all these things, it's not about him. It's about the one who sent him. So if you see Christ, you see God, like Christ himself tells you. If you see me, you see the one who sent me. If you see me, you see the Father. Because why? Because Christ is representing God. He's representing the Father because we're told that God dwells in unapproachable light, right? God dwells in unapproachable light that no man can see or has ever seen, right? You cannot see God's face, his presence, his panim, right? who alone has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can ever see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. So we're told that God has immortality and God dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has ever seen or can see. So does this mean that the first person of the Trinity dwells in unapproachable light that no man has seen or has ever seen? but yet you can see the second member of the triune God who is supposed to be of the same exact essence and nature and divinity of the Father, but you can see the second member of the Trinity? That to me seems a little bit silly and contradictory, right? Because there's no evidence of this or anybody trying to get us to understand this. And so we're told that God has immortality and he dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man can see or has ever seen. I think we should take that for what it is, not try to insert our own bias and say, well, that, that can't really be true because Jesus Christ is God, and he, and he came down and became a baby. And then they say that they saw God, who was wrapped up in, a, in the flesh of a baby, to explain about the God who can't be seen because the first member of the Trinity dwells in unapproachable light. And they can't see him, but you can see the second member of the Trinity who is in the flesh of a baby, and he's going to explain about the first member of the Trinity. You know, that just becomes really uh, kind of silly, right? You can see that God says that you cannot see his face, his his penine, right? His his penine, his face. You cannot see the face of God and live. And it's actually more. Um, it's just more concrete in the Hebrew, right? Like you can see, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. Well, in the Hebrew, face is panim. It's pane, and it means presence, right? So we can go through Exodus 33, 20. I don't prepare for these. So uh, sometimes I take a little bit longer to pull up scripture. I don't have everything ready. Uh, most of the time I don't prepare, I just do it. Right. And that's kind of, I, cause I like to learn. I like to, I like to see things. I don't like to have a prepared script because I don't, I like to, to just go by what I see and what I, what, what comes to, to the spirit and, and what scripture actually says. So we can see that 
no man can see my face. You cannot see my face, my pene, my panim, right? You cannot see the face of God and live. His pene, his panim. Well, this means presence, the continence of God. So when he says my face, a lot of people kind of get distracted and think that this is God's literal face. Well, we know that God is a spirit. God does not have a literal face. So when they translate in Hebrew face, you have to know what face means. Right. We can see in other instances where God says, my presence will go with you, but it's the same word, face. So we can see in panim, pene, my face, my faces, my faces will go with you. And you can see in here, it talks about the presence. They hid themselves from the panim, the pene of God, the presence of God. They hid themselves from the face of God. Again, God does not have a literal face. He does not have a literal back. It's his countenance. It's his presence, his face. Is his presence, right? His face. So that needs to be clear. Again, nobody can see God's face, his presence, and live. You cannot see the presence of God and live. God dwells in unapproachable light that nobody can see or has ever seen. You should take that and just accept it. And um, and and that will make scripture uh make a lot more sense to you. And instead of trying to trying to make uh uh, an understanding of how they can see the second member of the Trinity, but they can't see the first member of the Trinity and, and, and all these things. Um, I'm going to pull up uh, when God tells, the Lord tells Moses that his presence will go with you, right? It says, and he says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Okay, my presence will go with you. Well, in Hebrew, again, it's panim, it's pene. It's the same exact word when he says, my presence will go with you. So when we see in Exodus 33, 20, we can see here where, when I had it pulled up before, let me pull it up again here. Apologize. I just want to show you the parallels between um, the presence of God and um, the uh, face. It's, it's important to understand what presence mean, what face actually means in the Hebrew and what, what they're trying to convey, right? What they're trying to convey. Here it says, my face, you cannot see my face, right? My face, again, the, the, the Hebrew word there is pene. It means presence of God, my presence, right? My presence of God, my face. You cannot see my face. They hid themselves from the presence. So when we go to... Um, we go to passages like this, my presence will go with you. We can look at um, the, the Greek on this, and we can see what this actually means. And it means the same exact thing. Uh, it means the same exact thing as no man can see my face and live. Right? No man can see my face and live. We can see here, I will give you rest, and my presence will go with you. See the, the word panay? Strong 640, strong 6440, my pene, my presence. See how they translate it? My presence will go with you. But if you look at here uh, in, the, in the Hebrew, they translate it as my face. You cannot see my face, strong 6440, my face, my panim. You cannot see my face, my panim, right? But again, my presence will go with you, 6440, pene, panim. Same exact wording. So you can also translate it as no man can see my presence and live, right? It means the presence of God, my face, my pene. You, you cannot see my pene and live. This one says my pene will go with you. My pene will go with you. And what do we get when we look at the word pene? We see face, faces, right? My faces will go with you, or my panim or my pene will go with you. So that's something that you need to understand when you look at um, that piece of scripture, when it talks, talks about God dwells in unapproachable light that nobody can see or has ever seen. You have to understand what that means, and it means literally that you cannot see the presence of God and live. You would, you would die because he dwells in unapproachable light. So like I've mentioned before, one of the most important passages that helps you understand the relationship between God and his son is John 12, 44 and 45. And I think this is really overlooked. This is an overlooked passage for a number of reasons. And Jesus cries out and says, 
He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. Again, he who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. So when you're starting to believe these things about Christ, like maybe in Orthodox Christianity, and you're told these things that Jesus is God, and he's the first and the last, and he's the Alpha and the Omega, Christ is telling you, if you believe in me, you do not believe in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. And we'll get into this a little bit here about what this means, right? It's 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 basically telling you that whatever you're you're believing about Christ, you're not to believe it about him. You're to believe it about the one who sent him, because if you see Christ, you see the one who sent him. He is representing God, right? Because why? Because, again, the Bible tells us that God can't be seen. God is invisible. He dwells in unapproachable light. So Jesus Christ came to represent God. And you have to ask yourself, how could Christ do the works of God? And teach with the authority of God and not be God. And again, this is agency. I've covered it in many of my videos. For those of you who want to know more about it, you can go through some of my videos. For those of you who are already familiar with it, then you can just uh, continue um, listening. And so, again, there's there's agency in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And, and you know that when you read the scriptures, you can see the agent is the one who's authorized to act for or in place of another. And so in Hebrew terms, the agent or the one sent is called the shalia. And you can see like scriptures that talk about the sent one, you know, the, the shalia, the sent one, how God sent him. And you look at the, the Hebrew on it, uh, shalak, shalia, right? The sent, God sent him, he sent. So when we talk about shalia, that's a, it's derived from the word Shalak, and it means to send. Okay. And we can see that God sent him. The Lord sent Christ. The Lord is the one who sent him. And so the New Testament equivalent to the Shaliak is apostle or apostolos. And that's in the Greek. And it means basically a messenger, like Malak is somebody that's sent as a, as a messenger, once sent on a mission. The Malak is the Hebrew, of course, right? So when you look at the theological dictionary of the New Testament, you can see that the one sent was considered to be the legal representative of the sender. So when you interact with this shalia, it's tantamount to interacting face-to-face -face with the sender. And so this face-to-face -face aspect is one of the features of this Hebraic agency that's foreign to many of our ways of thinking because we're thinking through a Western lens, right? And so it's very common, you know, in the Hebraic culture to the one who is sent is like the one who sent him. You can look at later in the Talmud and all these things that are actually derived. And some of this stuff in Talmud, I, I don't even buy into, but the Talmud is kind of an extension on civil laws and things that talk about being sent. Like somebody could act on your behalf and marry your wife, but you know, they're, they're, being, they're being given authority by you, but they're not, li they're not literally marrying your wife as themselves. They're marrying uh, with your name and authority. And you're going to be married. You are going to be married to your wife, not this person who's standing there saying, I do, right? So a man's agent is equivalent to himself. And, and so the shalia may act on behalf of the one who sent him. And so when one deals with the shalia, it's as if they're dealing with the one who sent that person. And you can look at, I don't want to get too much off the track, but you can see agency, um, Jewish encyclopedia, and you can see how they talk about agency in the Jewish encyclopedia, right? The one who is sent is equal to the one who sent him. Right here, the agency, you can see that the general principle is enunciated like this. A man's agent is like himself, right? Shalia, shalia, the one who is sent, okay? When it's acting as a, uh, the one who binds a principle in this manner is his agent, right? His agent. So Jesus Christ was God's ultimate agent. He was sent by God. OK, and you can see that, um, like, for example, in some of my other videos where Moses was called God, Exodus 7, 1, he was made Elohim to Pharaoh because he was God's agent. And so also in my other videos, you can see where Joseph was seen as the Pharaoh's equal because he was the king's agent. And also the actions of Christ's disciples were portrayed as being his. Remember in the baptism and Jesus says, uh, you know, that um, 
like like you can say where where if you do not listen if they do not listen to you they do not listen to me and if they do not if they reject they reject me they reject the one who sent me so and we're told that like in john 3 22 through 20 26 that jesus was there baptizing and all people were coming to him but we find out later in the book of john 4 immediately after that jesus was not actually doing it his disciples were or when Saul was persecuting the disciples. Jesus called from heaven and said, why are you persecuting me, Saul? Why are you persecuting me? Well, Saul wasn't persecuting Jesus. He was persecuting the disciples. By, by, by extension, by persecuting the disciples, he was persecuting Jesus, right? And so it was acceptable in that culture because the disciples had been appointed by Christ. And so when you understand this precept of agency and you're able to recognize it, it will help you better understand Scripture, right? And it helps you understand that that when you see Christ, you do see the Father. You do see God. But Jesus tells you that the authority is not his, right? The words that he speaks are not his own. It's not his own will, right? And so when you understand this language and it's used in conjunction with Christ throughout Scripture, a lot of times, I don't know, three dozen times or so, this New Testament speaks of Christ being sent by God. And the vast majority of these are in the book of John. And so when you look at these passages, the purpose for which Christ was sent to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God was to represent the Father, right? To represent the Father because, again, God can't be seen, right? God dwells in unapproachable light that nobody can see or has ever seen. I can't stress this enough. This should be an emphasis in your mind, and it should be a starting point, and then you build from there. You don't start believe in Jesus was God who came to represent the one who can't be seen, right? And and he's also God. But he said to them, I must preach, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. I was sent for this purpose, right? Christ was sent for the purpose to preach the good news of the kingdom. Um, you can look at other passages throughout scripture. I mean, it's just filled with uh the verses that talk about how Jesus was sent, right? Nobody's denying this. I mean, even Trinitarians will tell you that Jesus was sent, but see, they don't understand why he was sent, right? They want you to believe that this is just his human nature fulfilling a role to, uh, you know, that was obligatory to um, to <laughs> enumerate basically the Father's will, but he was also God, right? In this is love not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the expiation for our sins. He loved us and sent His Son. There was a man sent from God. His name was John. But nobody is trying to say that John was really sent from God, meaning he came down from the sky. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. As they are of heaven, so are those who. As is the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. Right? They are not of this world just as I am not of this world. It makes perfect sense when you start applying the same idiomatic expressions to those who are also said to be not of this world when you apply them to Christ, right? And so God loved the world and he sent his son, right? God loved the world and he sent his son. It means to be to be sent from God means that you, you're not derived from mankind. God is its ultimate source. It doesn't come from human beings, right? As we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. So God is the ultimate source. God is the ultimate source, right? It's not Jesus. Okay, so those who believe Jesus is God, they think it was Christ's idea to save the world, or at least he played an equal role as, as a member of the triune God team or whatever that implemented this plan. But Jesus tells you that it was God the Father doing this and not his own, right? It was God the Father doing all these things and not his own. And I'm going to have to switch my screen here because I have a touchpad and it gets really finicky. So let me switch my screen really quick. I apologize. What happens is I drag my screen and then I lose it and then I have to go back and forth and it just really is a uh, really frustrating. So we can see here where as we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son as the savior of the world okay the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world right and and here i think i already i've already mentioned that one i apologize if i went over it again um here 
screen went away, so I got distracted. But it says here, Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded and came forth from God. Okay, There was a man sent from God. His name is John. To come forth from God doesn't mean that you're coming down from heaven. If you come forth from God, this is a Hebraic term to understand that you're not being derived from mankind. You're coming from God, right? You're, you have a heavenly origin, meaning a heavenly commission. Not, not that you're commissioned by mankind. You're from God. You come from heaven, right? And so I've come not of my own accord, but he sent me. Again, this would make kind of no sense, really, if Jesus was God. He says, I've come not of my own accord or I've come not of my own will. If, if he was God, this certainly would be his own will, right? To say that he's come not to do his own will um, and his own accord, to me, that would be a, a little bit strange, right? So an agent who comes on behalf of the sender is by definition not the sender, okay? If you're sent by God or a, a messenger of God, you're not God. You're of God. You're being sent for, as a messenger of God, but you're not God. And Christ says many times in the Gospel of John, basically, you know, John is, is replete, re, replete with these, these wordings, that he does not speak or act on his own initiative. So even the laying down of his own life was done at the Father's command. And this is all keeping with the principle of agency. Again, as God's agent, Christ did only the will of him who sent him. The God sent Christ to accomplish his will. And this is very important in, in, in the New Testament thematically, right? Jesus tells you repeatedly that he did only the Father's will is not his own, right? He tells you this over and over again. Um over and over again, Jesus stresses that it's not his it's not his doing, right? It's not his will. It's not his words to speak. I can do nothing on my own authority. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Again, I can do nothing on my own authority. This would be really silly to say if you're God, okay? He doesn't say I, my human nature can do nothing. I can do nothing on my own authority. Me. The person, not the human nature within the person. I can do nothing on my own authority. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not my own will again. He's seeking something that's not even his own will. He's seeking not his own will, but the will of him who sent me. So who is Jesus seeking the will of the one who sent him? Who is the authority derived from? God, the Father, who has given Jesus the authority. I can do nothing on my own authority. Right? I can do nothing on my own authority. If Christ was Jehovah, you would expect that this would be his authority, right? This would be the same that of God the Father. And by doing God's will, he would be accomplishing his own. But we can see that, that Christ and God had different wills throughout Scripture, right? So Jesus chose to do only the will of the one who sent him. And this is perfect, again, with the, har the harmonious aspect of, of the law of agency. So again, the shalia, the agent, performs an act of legal significance for the benefit of the sender as opposed to him or himself. And that's why Christ was a servant, right? He set aside his own will uh, that he wanted to do and did the will of the one who sent him. So as Christ's agent or God's agent, rather, Jesus spoke only the words given to him. And so, you know, when I speak with Trinitarians and those who believe in the deity of Jesus, they, they contend that he preexisted in heaven as the word of God. So as the word of God or God, the word, you would expect him to speak his own words and deliver his own teachings. But when you actually read scripture and stick to what scripture says, Jesus did nothing like this, right? He speaks many times that the words that he spoke, they came not of himself, but from the one who sent him, right? And I'll go over a couple of these passages, right? I'll go over a couple of these passages. If this was the eternal word. Jesus Christ would be speaking his own words, but he tells you they're not his words. Right, they're not his words to speak. They're, they're the fathers. They belong to the fathers, right? The Jews marveled at it, saying, "How can it be that this man is learning when he has never studied?" So Jesus answered them, "My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me." Again, this would be his teaching if he was God, right? It would be kind of weird to say, "My teaching is not my own, but it's his who sent me." If any man's will is to do his will, he shall know whether the teaching is from God one person, or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. Again, if Jesus was God, he wouldn't be dancing in circles and going around all of these things and confusing you, right? Uh, my teaching is not my own, but it's his who sent me. Well, 
if he's the second member of a triune Godhead, the teaching would be his. Okay, he doesn't say this teaching is not my own, and I'm speaking from a human nature. My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Okay, irrelevant, just irrelevant and just nonsensical if he's God, the second member of a trinity, this would be his teaching. But he tells you, if any man's will is to do his will, he should know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. Again, you don't see the Father here, you see God. And this is certainly striking if you're a Trinitarian because this, this would become arbitrary and very confusing. Which member of the God person's Godhead is he talking about? Well, we know that's the Father, but again, it becomes arbitrary if we're not told this and you're just imagining and assuming things. Whether the teaching is from the Father or whether I'm speaking on my own authority, right? But it says God. And we know that throughout Scripture, God and Christ are always separated. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, of God and the Lamb, right? In the presence of God and the presence of the Messiah, right? So, you know, Jesus tells you the teaching is not my own, right? John 8, 28, also the same type of parallels we can see here. Same type of parallels in John 8, 28. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and I do nothing on my own authority, but speak thus as the Father has taught me. Again, I can do nothing on my own authority. Again, this would be nonsensical if you're God, or you're trying to make the case that you're God. Okay, Nobody in their right mind would start thinking, are you God? If he said, I can do nothing on my own authority, but speak thus the Father has taught me. You don't need to be taught if you're God. Okay, You, you, you know everything. So it would be your authority. To say that you can do nothing on your own authority proves that you're not God, at least as anybody that's not indoctrinated or somebody that just wants to believe something so bad that they'll just deny basic common sense logic and reasoning, right? So this great teacher, Christ, who's called a rabbi, has a teacher. And so these words, if Trinitarians want to use red letters in the Bible, these are actually from God and not from Christ, okay? Just as the Lord taught Moses what to say. God taught Jesus what to say, right? That's why God says, I will raise up from among the brethren a prophet, and I will put my words in his mouth. A, a prophet like you, Moses, okay? doesn't say ever say that God would send down God to become a prophet. So in addition, Christ repeatedly states that the source of his words, which we call the gospel message, they did not originate with him, but they were given to him by God, okay? They were given to him by God. Right. And again, these would be his words. These this would be his doctrine. This would be his will. This would be his authority. But he says the opposite. Right. He says the opposite. For I have not spoken on my own authority. Right. The father who has sent me has given me a commandment of what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the father has commanded me or bidden me. OK. I have not spoken on my own authority. Okay, this would be his authority if he was God, but he has not spoken on his own authority. Not Nothing about his human nature. I have not spoken on my own authority. The Father who sent me, right, send me Shalia, apostolos, he sent me, has given me a commandment what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has bidden me, right? The Father has bidden me. Uh, other passages, there's so many, I don't want to get into too many of them, but uh, <clears throat> I'm just trying to show you uh, what Christ is, is speaking about when he says he was sent by God. It's not his will. It's not his doctrine. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. Again, the words that you hear are not Christ's words. If Christ was the God back in the Old Testament, the Lord, he would be speaking his words because he often quotes from the Old Testament. But he tells you the words which you hear are not my own, or it's not mine, it's the Father who sent me. The word is not mine. The authority is not mine. The will is not mine. The doctrine is not mine. Right? If you see me or if you believe in me, you do not believe in me. You believe in the one who sent me. Over and over again, he's telling you that he's not God. He's representing God. So Christ was God's human agent who he commissioned to speak divine truth to the world. Christ tells you in John 8, 40. Oh, my goodness. Did I do that again? I think I did that again. Hold on. I have to go back. John 8, 40 here. Let me go back to this menu here. I exited out of this window. 
And it's really starting to drive me crazy. Here. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Right? Jesus was a man who told you the truth, which he heard from God. So Jesus did only the works of the one who sent him. Right? Only the works of the one who sent him. Let's see here. Not his own works, not his own will, only the works of him who sent him. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. To do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. To do the will of him who sent me. Right? Jesus Christ was sent by God. Do God's work, to do God's will, to do God's bidding. Right? Jesus was God's agent, his ultimate emissary. And so if Jesus was God, you would expect to say our work, or at least my work. But you don't see this. You see that he accomplished the work of the only true God, which Christ identifies as the Father, right? He identifies as the Father. And a lot of people don't like this when Jesus Christ declares that the Father is the only true God because they really want Jesus to be God. But this is not what Jesus proclaimed or taught. He never tried to make the case that he was God, right? Father, the hours come, glorify thy son, since you have given him power over all flesh. Jesus was given power over flesh, not that he was God. God does not need to be given power. Jesus Christ was given power to be able to give eternal life to those who have given him. Okay, we're told that, and Jesus tells you, this is eternal life, that they know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ who you have sent. This is, this is the eternal life message, that we know the Father as the only true God and Jesus the Messiah. Notice there's no mention of a third person of the Trinity here. So eternal life is to know the Father as the only true God and Jesus, the Messiah, who you sent. Okay, Jesus was sent by the only true God. And we know that the Father has life in himself and has granted the Son to have life. God does not need to be granted life. Okay, the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life. Right? The Father has life in himself, and he has granted the Son also to have life. And that's why Jesus prays here. He prays, and he acknowledges that God the Father gave him this. Right, You have given him power over flesh to give eternal life. The Father has life in himself and has granted the Son to have life. God has granted him life, has given Jesus the power to have life, to have power over flesh, to give eternal life to those who has given him. Right. And so the works themselves were to serve as proof, not that Jesus was God, but that God was his working through him. Right. That Jesus was God's human agent. And so you can see on the day of Pentecost when when Peter was preaching, you know, and, and I'm sure people know a lot about you know, Acts 22. This is kind of beating it down. Right. But we can see here where men of Israel hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth was God. No, they don't say that. Jesus of Nazareth was Jehovah incarnate. No, Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God. Notice there's no father. There's no Trinity. We have God there. And if God was a Trinity, this would be kind of confusing. They would isolate. It would seem to me, I would, that they would isolate one person of the Trinity, but they don't do this. They tell you that God. So Jesus is one person. God is another Jesus was a man attested by God with mighty works and wonders and signs, which God did through him. Okay, God is the one doing these, right? That's what Jesus tells you. The works that you hear are the words that you hear are not my own. The Father who dwells in me does his works. So God did these works through the man Christ Jesus. This is what Peter testifies at the um at uh at Pentecost. They don't try to make the case that Jesus is God, right? He does. He doesn't try to tell you this at all. That's not the case that that Jesus is trying to make. Jesus goes on to say, "But the testimony which I have is greater than that of John. For the works which the Father has granted me to accomplish, these very works which I am doing bear witness that the Father has sent me." Okay, so the mm -hmm. Father has sent Christ to do these works. And many Christians believe that the reason Jesus was able to perform these works is because he's God or he's deity. 
But this isn't true, right? Jesus credited God with doing the miracles, right? And so did the apostles. So did the apostles. They don't credit Jesus by doing these things, that Jesus was a man, that God did the miracles through. See, people don't give credit for who was actually doing the miracles, signs, and wonders. They say Jesus was, no, the Father. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that you that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Again, that it's not his authority. It would be really kind of silly if he was God. I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Okay, the Father who dwells in me does the works. Who's doing the works? God. God the Father is doing the works, not Jesus. Jesus is not speaking on his own authority. The Father dwelling in him is doing the works, which is exactly what Peter at Pentecost, like I brought up earlier, talks about. That men of Israel hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man, attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs, which God did through him. Okay, God did these miracles, signs, and wonders through the Messiah. And we can see, again, in the book of Acts, now, people really get confused on who was actually there dwelling. It was God. God was with them and that God was in the Messiah doing miracles, signs, and wonders. How God anointed Jesus. Notice one person is called God. One person is called Jesus, right? God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power. God does not need to be anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good all and healing all that were oppressed for the devil. For God was with him. So God was with them again. Emmanuel, God with us. God was with them in that God was with the Messiah. You could just read it if, if Jesus was God and see how silly this sounds. How God anointed God with the Holy Spirit and with power. How God went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed with the devil, for God was with God. Doesn't that sound silly? Like God would not need to be with God. And why would God need to be anointed with the Holy Spirit and power? So the, the human nature of, of the that, that that's within the person can now receive this anointing and be able to do miracle signs and wonders when he already has the ability to do this in his God nature. So in his God nature, he has this ability, but his human nature, he doesn't. And then God has anointed him with power. So his human nature can do things to show that he's God when his God nature is already there. It just, again, it becomes just uh, really silly, right? And so, as God's human agent, Jesus was given authority to accomplish his mission. Jesus did not come in his own authority. Okay, this is something that you would expect if he was God, but the authority is from the one who sent him. Right? The authority was the one who sent him. It tells you, I have come in my father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive. I have come in my Father's name. I have come in my Father's name, right? He's, he's come in the name of the Father, representing the Father. Not that he is the Father, not that he's God, but he's representing God, the Father who has sent him to represent him. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness to me. So the works that Jesus does in his Father's name bear witness to him. To come in someone's name means you have come in their authority. I will send forth an angel. You will listen to him or he will not forgive you every transgressions for my name is in him. Christ accomplished his agency in the authority that God gave him. So if Christ was God, he wouldn't need to be given this authority. He would possess it. But if Jesus is God's human agent, like the, like the gospel tells you, that he would need God's divine power and authority to accomplish what he was doing. And so... You know, Jesus is presented in John as, as you know, this backdrop of, of human agency and understanding that there's one chief agent who God acts through. And, and, and Christ is the chief agent of God. When he, when he confronts Christ, he confronts God. Like Jesus tells you, the one who listens to you listens to me. And he rejects you, rejects, or he rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. And so... A person's agent is regarded as the person himself. So if you commit an act against this agent, you are committing an act against the one who sent him. So the principle of agency is something that helps you harmonize scripture. It helps you harmonize why, you know, the Jews were getting very upset when Jesus was uh, claiming, you know, when, when they were saying that, 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 that he was a man and he was making himself out to be God, right? You can see these passages 
they really start making sense when you understand the precept of agency. This is why the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because not only he broke the Sabbath, but also called God his own father, making himself equal with God. Okay? He was putting himself in a position of power that only God had. Like Jesus tells you, like in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one, right? They're in unification and protecting the flock. Not that I and the Father are one heist. It's I and the Father are one hen. It means united. That's in my other videos. I and the Father are one, right? Jesus says, uh, like I said in John 12, 44, if you believe in me, you do not believe in me. You believe in the one who sent me. It's all about the one who sent him. Not about Jesus being God. It's about the one who sent Jesus. And Jesus cried out and said, he who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me, right? And that's why John, Jesus says, or John clarifies uh, in John 20, 28, my Lord and my God. Because again, you know, if you see me, you see the one who sent me. If you see me, you see the father. From now on, you have seen him and have known him. Show us the father. Show us the father. Don't you believe that I am in the father and the father in me? The father dwelling in me does his works. Believe because of the works. So when Thomas saw the resurrected Lord, he realized what Jesus had been telling him all along. If you see me, you see the father. Don't you believe that the father dwells in me, does the works? The works was the resurrection of the Messiah. Not that all of a sudden Thomas thought that, there's Jesus who's God because I saw God was raised from the dead. So, you know, they, they use passages like these, you know, like John uh, 5, 18, he was making himself equal with God. John 10, 30, I and the Father are one, you know, um, that Thomas said, my Lord and my God. But again, this is Jesus communicating agency, right? The one sent is like the one who sent me. If you see me, you see the one who sent me. If you believe in me, you do not believe in me. You believe in the one who sent me. So, the agent cannot carry out divine functions without the authorization of the one who sent him. Okay. And you can see that he's, you know, people are depicted as in divine language as sitting on God's throne or alongside of God and even bear the divine name. That's why Jesus tells you that the one who received him receives the one who sent him, right? Always about agency. It's about representation. Representation is critical. If you don't like the word agency, don't use agency. Use representation or uh, emissary. That's fine. He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives him who's, who sent me. So if you receive Christ, you receive the one who sent him. If, if they receive the apostles, they receive Jesus, right? So to dishonor Jesus is to reject and dishonor God because he's sent on God's behalf. If you reject the agent by default, you have rejected the sender. Okay, that's why it tells you in John 5, 23, which people try to use to, to try and prove that Jesus is God or you have to worship Jesus as, as you, the Father because he's God. That's not what it means, right? It means that all that may honor the Son, even as they honor the Father, he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Okay, so if you do not honor Jesus as you honor the Father, you do not honor the Father who sent him. All back to agency, right? All back to agency. It's all representation. He who hears you hears me, and he who rejects you rejects me, and he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. Okay, so by rejecting Christ, you reject the one who sent him. So Jesus is the ultimate emissary of God, God's only begotten. Jesus was able to represent God the Father more completely than anybody else because he had a, a, a really good relationship with God, right? He was pure, he was blameless, and he was the one who was able to execute the Father better than anybody else. Moses you know, was close to God, but Moses had doubts, and Moses was saying, hey, send somebody else. You know, he was kind of unsure and god god didn't like this jesus was very very sure of, of his of his um of his mission and he was able to accomplish it so you know this this gives you clarity when you understand agency it gives you clarity to understand who christ is his ministry and also his relationship to god and and so there's many many faith faithful agents throughout the scripture both past and present but Christ surpasses them all as God's ultimate agent of the Most High. And, and even the demons rec recognize Jesus. They don't recognize Jesus as God. They recognize Jesus as 
as the son of God, right? The son of God who, who was sent, not, not that Jesus Christ was Jehovah, right? That's kind of, that's kind of silly. And all that, well, that's not the one that I wanted to pull up here. I wanted to pull up Luke 8.28. My um, computer's getting a little weird. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell before down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Son of the Most High God. Not God, the Son of the Most High God. Demons know who Christ is. The demon identified Christ not as the Most High God, but as a son. And that's designated him as the Messiah or the Christ. And so as the only begotten, right, as the only begotten Son of God, Christ's agency is unique that he was sent by God to reconcile all things unto God through his sacrificial death. And so he's the only one who has been exalted to God's right hand and for his obedience and given the authority to rule on God's behalf. And so it's no wonder that Paul refers to Christ as the last Adam. It should also be no surprise to us that find out that Jesus' desire to glorify the one who sent him was the motivation for carrying out his agency. And speaking about himself, Christ tells you that the one who speaks from himself seeks not his own glory, but he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, right? Jesus is seeking the glory of the one who sent him. It's all about the one who sent. He who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. Okay, Jesus was not speaking of his own authority, but he who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. So how should you respond to Christ, who is the agent of God, who's God's human agent? You have to allow Christ to answer the question in his own words. You have to allow Christ to answer the question in his own words. Don't start putting words into the mouth of Jesus. Just trust Jesus, right? Jesus answered them. This is the work of God, that you may believe in him who he has sent. So was Jesus God? No. He was God in a representative way. He was representing the authority of God the Father who can't be seen. God is invisible. That's why God sends angels down. God has angels for a reason. God has ministers. God has prophets. Angels would be irrelevant really in the Old Testament is if God could theophanize at will. Angels were the ones who were sent on behalf of God. God's kind of like, uh, like a huge electrical conduit. And God has resistors, which are angels that kind of take away this power uh that can be channeled that we can actually hold it and be tangible god if he appeared it would be just too amazing and too awesome so he has messengers he sends messengers not that god is is incapable of it or god is weak the opposite is true god is too powerful it's like the sun coming down does the sun need to come down for you to be warm no the sun has rays that emanate from the sun the sun does not need to come down in its totality god is Sovereign. He his celestial abode, his erythral abode is in heaven. He doesn't come down uh in in totality, but he sends forth his spirit. His spirit, the personal power and presence of the Father on earth, is what comes forth, just like the rays of the sun come forth. God does not need to come down and manifest himself as a man because God is spiritual. God does spiritual things, but he he manifests himself through agents, through angels, and you can see the works being performed through uh human agents and others like like when god says with the staff that's in my hand i will strike the nile in exodus 7 but then he commands moses to tell aaron take up the staff put it in your hand and strike the nile who does it aaron does it right aaron's the one who has a staff in his hand but god says it's the staff that's in his hand and he's going to do it but then aaron does it but then the conclusion of exodus 7 is that the lord did it so when you understand agency you can understand the parallels of God working through his agents, through his angels, through his missionaries, through his disciples. And that's the beauty of it. God loves to work through his creation. God is not doing all these miracle signs and wonders through another person of the Godhead. Where is mankind involved? God is raising up God and God is appointing God and God is judging the world through God and God is making God sit at his right hand and God take the throne of King David. Again, this becomes silly when you understand <laughs> that Jesus is God and you're trying to make the case that Jesus is God. It, it eliminates the creation through all that God does, right? The beautiful part about it is God is not a dictator. God loves to involve his creation in everything he does. And Jesus was sent by God to represent God 
to exegete the Father who can't be seen. God is invisible. You have to take scripture for what it says. Don't start adding things and making the Bible say things it doesn't and make it be very complicated. I hope that helps. And with uh, that being said, uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And until next time, God bless you.